You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I am super excited to have Jean Kwok on the show with me today. Her book, Searching for Sylvie Lee, uh, is available everywhere now in paperback. This was a huge release uh, last year in hardback when it came out, made all sorts of lists for the year. And, um, you know, lot, lots of people have been talking about this book all year. Well, now... It's available in paperback and a great trade paperback size, uh, so you can get all of the the things you love about hardback, but you don't have to mortgage your house to to get the uh, the trade paperback size. It's out everywhere now, and Jean has been so gracious to join me from the Netherlands, I believe, uh, to talk about it. Welcome to the show, Jean. I'm so honored to be here with you because I just love your show and your work. Well, thank you, Gene. That that means a lot. Uh, I really appreciate it. Well, if you're familiar with the show at all, then you know that we begin each show with the same question. And that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? You know, Hank, I think I have a little bit of a different story, um, a different answer to that question than most other writers. I think most authors really know from a very young age that this is what they would be doing. And I, um, I had no idea. You know, I, I have a very different background because I'm a first generation Chinese immigrant. We moved from Hong Kong to the U.S. when I was five years old. And we were just really, really poor. We were working class, poor immigrants. And um, I lived in an apartment meant in Brooklyn that was not only falling down around our ears, literally, literally, the plaster was coming off the walls and the ceiling. It was overrun with roaches and rats, but mm. it didn't even have a working heating system. Like there was no heat in New York City all winter long. Um, and I worked in a factory. I worked in a clothing factory in Chinatown starting from when I was five through most of my childhood. So there was no space in my life to think about becoming an artist of any sort. I mean, I was just struggling to survive. I, I did love books. I mean, books were my favorite thing in the entire world. And I loved um, my library. And once I learned to read, because, of course, I didn't speak any English when I first came here. But, you know, I, I just loved escaping into books and, you know, reading and, you know, everything to do with books. But I mean, it didn't occur to me to write anything myself. That wasn't for people like me. And I certainly got no encouragement from my family or even teachers, you know, in school. I had some great educators, but it was about, you know, reading other people's work and writing criticism of their work. So, um, you know, I grew up. Uh, I wound up miraculously going to Harvard and I was a physics major there. And I remember I was sitting there doing a problem set late in the night. And, um, you know, I was doodling and making notes on a separate notepad while I was trying to figure out this very difficult math and physics problem. And then suddenly I wrote a poem and I was like, oh my God, <laughs> what, what is this? <laughs> it's like, what did I do? You know, I, I felt like I, I felt like I had laid an egg. You know, <laughs> I, I appalled at myself at the thing that had come out of my hand, and um, you know, that was the moment I realized, oh, I could actually write stuff too on top of reading. And I did, you know, I did keep a journal from when I was very young um, because my brother had who was older than me had given me a blank diary and he had said whatever you write in this will belong to you which was an incredibly powerful thought for you know a young immigrant kid who didn't speak English and who didn't belong anywhere so I did keep a diary but that was the first time I'd ever written anything creative 
And from very soon after that, I realized actually the only thing I wanted to do was to try to become an author. That That is such an amazing story. Um, you know, you we hear um, often that cliches are uh, are cliches for a reason. There, there's usually some truth behind cliches uh, and obviously exaggerated to it, at some point or uh, but there's there's a kernel of, of truth in them. And it seems, you know, the the immigrant uh, child doesn't speak the language, literally works in a sweatshop. I, I think I've heard you talk about the literally coming out drenched in sweat from from the shop. Um, it, it, you said that you loved books and stories as uh, as a, a kid and as you grew up. Did w- what sorts of stories were you drawn to? I um I loved you know there were I mean first of all to have stories about people like me you know people of color or immigrants that is a fairly new phenomenon yeah. so when I was a kid there was really like nothing that really was about someone similar to me but and you know I loved books like Little House on the Prairie and Anne of Green Gables you know though all of those was a Nancy Drew I mean I love books about girls I love books about misfits I read every book in my public library in the children's section I remember I went from A all the way to Z um, because you know I loved reading so much and I I, I think I, I loved um, the fact that sometimes I think especially for people who don't belong and whether you're an immigrant or not, you know, that's so many of us. When you feel like you don't belong, sometimes you connect more deeply to a character or a writer in a book than anybody else, you know, in real life. You yeah. know, and I think that was true for me for very much of my life. It's very interesting um, that you bring up the um, the idea of representation in books, uh, and and you're you're absolutely right. It is a a fairly new phenomenon to be able to pick up uh, a work in just about any genre and find characters that look like you and sound like you and and have a similar experience to you. But what I do find interesting is that you you found a way to connect with stories like Little House on the Prairie with characters. Uh, that uh, that are very different from you and from a different background as you journey as you but still find a way to connect to the human condition uh because while the window dressing may be different and by window dressing i mean the 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 genre the 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 setting things like that we're still talking about stories of the human condition there there's still stories about not fitting in finding your new place in life and and i do find it interesting that people from all backgrounds and uh, all nationalities and uh, can find ways to connect with each other through common experiences. I think that is so true. Um, and, you know, that's one of the things that I love so much about books. And, uh, you know, with all this talk about, oh, books might go extinct, I just think that's ridiculous because I think that. There is no other medium that allows you to connect so deeply with another person as a book. I think that, you know, when we write and when we read, we are in the heart and mind of another person. And just like you said, you know, regardless of your own gender, sexual identity, you know, race, culture, language, even language, what language you speak, it doesn't matter. You are purely in the heart and the mind of the person you're reading about. And I think that that is just such a beautiful thing. I think that, you know, sometimes people can know a character in a book better than they know their own husband. So, right. you know, <laughs> that, I, that, I think that's a wonderful thing. That's something I do think about when I'm writing my books, that I would like to carry my reader along with me and take them somewhere they might not have been before. And I hope that that journey will be enjoyable and enlightening. Jean, um, you mentioned earlier uh, that you didn't have this this early calling uh, to writing, if you will, if you want to look at it that way. Um, but you pursued science uh, in school and uh, were very good at it. And but then switched, you know, when when you kind of had this discovery that that storytelling may be something that you want to pursue more, you you switched over to that. 
Um, I think in a lot of people's minds, we think of ourselves as either one way or the other. You know, I can either be good at science or I'm more artistic. Uh, and and that the, those two it, it seem to be mutually exclusive in our minds, but they don't necessarily have to be that way. Um, can can you talk a little bit about that that switch for you and going from the more analytical minded and pursuing science, and then switching over to uh, studying English and then following this path? You know, Hank, you are such a great interviewer because I have never <laughs> had this question before, and it's such a kind of deep and interesting subject, because indeed, that's true. I mean, I think most people think of, you know, are you a math person? Or are you a humanities person? Right. You know, one or the other. I don't have that dichotomy, but I can tell you that my intelligence is really very selective. So, you know, I mean, <laughs> there are things that I may be good at and maybe better at than your average person, but there are things that I am so much worse at than an right. average person. But I, it too. doesn't, right, it doesn't just, for me, it doesn't divide along the math and the humanities line. Um, I do think that I still have a pretty mathematical sensibility when I write. And what I mean by that is that the more I write, the more, um, you know, the further along, Searching for Sylvia Lee is my third novel, the more I plan and the more structurally I think about my books, Um so, you know, that's something we can go into maybe at more depth later on. But, you know, I Searching for Silver Lee is, has a, I hope is a very easy read, but because it is a mystery and a suspenseful read on top of being about culture and a family and all of that, it, um, it really needed to be planned quite carefully. And the timing of it had to be um, really precise. So that I could drop a clue and then have it be revealed and open up another question. You know, all of these things I think I do carry from my science background. Um, but in terms of, you know, selective intelligence, I mean, I was considered a complete disaster at home the entire time I was growing <laughs> up. You know, yeah, as a Chinese daughter, I was 100 percent a failure because I make very bad dumplings. You know, I am like a terrible cook. I'm a terrible housekeeper. I was, you know, and I, I love to read. And that meant that I was indeed one of those dreamy kids. So even though I didn't write down my stories the way other writers do at a young age, I had tons of stories in me. And I was lost in my own stories all the time instead of, you know, sweeping the floor or doing the dishes or any of the other things I was supposed to do. Um, and then, you know, just in terms of, you know, basic competence, I mean, I can't swim, I can't drive, and I will never, ever be able to drive. Because even <laughs> on a bicycle, you know, I here in the Netherlands, everyone rides around on a bicycle. And, you know, on I mean, on the bicycle, like, I basically almost kill people, you know, so, um, yeah, intelligence is selective. Th that's that. That's hilarious. And I, I love every everything that you said there. Um, Searching for Sylvie Lee is is your third novel. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Girl in Translation, then Mambo in Chinatown and now Searching for Sylvie Lee. Do I have those in order? Perfect. So these three books uh, seem to be uh, informed, at least from experiences in your life, not that they're biography or that they tell your story, but they seem to be informed by stories of your life. Do, is that a fair thing to say? Oh, absolutely. I think that's very true. When you begin a story, um, I'm fascinated by the beginnings of things. And uh, I, I love to hear how things begin because um, you hold a book in your hand and, you know, it can be three, four hundred, five hundred pages. And it's this whole journey of these characters. But that journey begins with one thing usually that sets a stage and maybe it's a character, maybe it's a setting that you see, maybe it's a, a, a new story that you uh, watch and it starts off a, a what if, or maybe in your case, it's a real life experience that then you start playing with how this might have played out differently with different characters or, or what have you. Um, how, what is that first nugget usually like for you that begins the story process? I think that is so true that there is this kind of lightning bolt moment where you think I have a book, 
you know, this is something that can be a book, that I want to be a book. And I remember with my first novel, Girl in Translation, I, um, I was really just sitting by myself doodling on this pad that was shaped like a teddy bear. You know, so it like had a round head and two ears. And I was just doodling in this pad and I suddenly I saw the beginning image of the book and the closing image of the book. And I just I, I at that moment I knew, oh, I have this book. And for searching for Sylvia Lee, it was even more personal because of us girl in translation was is like you said, my work is all semi-autobiographical, although it is, of course, also fiction. Girl in translation was more about the past I told you about where about being very poor and, you know, a young girl who's bright, but caught between her life at an exclusive private school and um, her night, her other life working, you know, in a clothing factory in Chinatown. And searching for Sylvie Lee is uh, deeply personal to me because um, I told you earlier about that brother who in the time when we were working in the factory, you know, he was, it was my brother, Quan. He's older than me. So when I was uh, in elementary school, he was in high school. And, you know, we used to get, you know, get up, go to school, do school all day, then get out, go to the factory. And all the homework had to be done on the subway or during breaks at the factory. And then I would go home at like nine or 10 at night with my parents after working at the factory. But my brothers would go on to a second job waiting tables at a restaurant until two or three in the morning and it was in that time period that Quan had somehow managed to save enough to give me that blank diary as a purse as a present which started me writing but what happened many years later was that Quan um you know we got out of that factory life Quan went to MIT I went to Harvard and then one Thanksgiving just about 10 years ago a little bit over 10 years ago Quan didn't come home. Um, and so he disappeared. And as I told you, you know, I, in our family, I might have gone to a good school, but I was like the black sheep of the family due to all the disasters in the kitchen and so on. So, you know, Quan was really the golden child. And um, when he disappeared, you know, I, I, like, normally he would be the person we would call to say, oh my gosh, you know, what do we do now? But that person was the very one in trouble who was gone. And Searching for Sui Lee, of course, is about, um, you know, these three women who are two sisters and the mother who are tied together by these long buried secrets. And when the story starts, what happens is that the older, dazzling, golden sister, Sylvie, goes to the Netherlands to visit her dying grandmother and disappears. And her stuttering, shy, younger sister, Amy, who's always been in Sylvie's shadow, has to pull herself together to figure out what happened to Sylvie. And then for me, that was in real life exactly the same feeling I had when Quan disappeared that I thought, oh, my gosh, I have to pull myself together and try to find out what happened to him. Um, so that was the emotional core, core of the novel. But of course, it took me many years before I could gather myself together to write it and when I started to write it I originally wanted to write about the disappearance of a man and I just couldn't write that book so that was too close to real life and the gravitational pull of the real life story so I changed him to a woman and at the moment it became a story about two sisters it really took off and took on its own life um and then, you know, the entire story kind of came into being after that decision. Isn't that fascinating that that switching the character from uh, from a man to a woman would have that profound effect on you? Um, you know, and you think, well, I mean, these are just made up characters they they don't really exist yet. There's such an emotional tie. Um, that that even though maybe a male character that you're thinking about was not Quan, uh, it just felt too real. It, I find that fascinating when things like that happen. It, it's so true. I think that, you know, that's why writing and reading are both such deep practices. I think that when we write, you know, we really write from the deepest part of our souls. And if we don't, you can feel that as a reader. Um, yeah. And I I really do believe that the, 
the page is like a meeting point between reader and writer. It's like this field where we all, we, you know, we meet and we interact and everyone brings their own background, their own images, their own loves, their own lost loves to the page when they read your book, which I think is a really beautiful thing. Both Barrels Publishing is the brainchild of successful indie author James P. Sumner. He has self-published over 15 titles in the last five years and has over 800,000 downloads so far in his career, meaning he has a wealth of knowledge and experience to share with the indie publishing community. Knowing the struggles of the modern-day indie author as well as he does, he wanted to create a platform that would allow writers of any level to learn the ropes, navigate the pitfalls, and produce a professional novel without wasting time or money in the process. Both Barrels Publishing is the perfect one-stop shop for any indie author, combining James's expertise with his own team of editors and designers so you can help your novel realize its full potential and learn how to publish yourself. The purpose of Both Barrels Publishing is to help indie authors get their novels ready for publication without all the stress, hassle, and unnecessary expense. We want to make your lives easier, which is why we're giving you access to a top-notch team to publish your novels, along with a generous discount on their services. You can also work one-on-one with James to learn the intricacies of self-publishing. No hidden cost, no false promises. We simply want you to publish the best version of your novel. BothBarrelsPublishing.com Jackson's battle to take control over his own mind and life portrays what millions of people are fighting with around the world. Mental illness. His mother, desperate to free him from his demons and desperation, faces her own turmoil and anguish, doing anything possible to save her son through love and hope. After countless emotional and heartbreaking triumphant moments, June and her son must both accept that only Jackson can save himself. Pick up Jackson by Lynn McLaughlin and discover why people are raving about this book and saying things like, Jackson is symbolic of millions living with some form of mental illness and his mother represents the millions who have their own struggles caring for someone with a mental health issue. Jackson by Lynn McLaughlin. Pick it up today at Amazon.com. Mentioned a minute ago, Gene, uh, of having this image of the beginning of the book and an, an image of the ending of the book. Are are you a visual writer uh, in that sense? Do you do you see the story unfolding uh, as you're writing it? Yes, I am. I am. I'm very much um, a visual writer. I also believe in the visual as you know something that's important to function on many different levels so that I think that you know for a reader you want the reader to be drawn in by your book to have an emotional connection to feel like they're seeing and feeling and hearing everything on in the novel but then on another level of course you want to layer meaning um, in the book that the reader might not be conscious of but that yet will make the book richer so for example in searching for sylvie lee i was very aware of setting and um and i mean i believe me i know people like to skim over setting you know i do too but uh, you know you try to make the setting as interesting as possible you try to make setting a way to reveal character so that you know for example the netherlands uh, you know the plains of the netherlands to Sylvie, you know, because th- in the story, Sylvie was given away by her parents when she was little to her grandmother who lived in the Netherlands to be brought up by the grandmother until she was about nine years old because the parents were just working day and night and couldn't afford to keep her with them. And this is something that I know people who have done it and I know people who have had it done to them who were the child who was given away. And... um she comes back after Amy is born and then spends the rest of her life in the United States. And to Sylvie, the Netherlands is going home. You know, when she goes back, it's the welcoming country where she was not asked to be exceptional the way she felt she had to be in the United States. And of course, she always felt like, you know, she never deserved to be loved because she was given away. 
um, for Amy, when Amy goes after Sylvie to the Netherlands to try to figure out what happened to her, the Netherlands is this terrifying, you know, land filled with very tall blonde people who speak this strange language. And for Ma, who never really learned English, for her, the Netherlands is a landscape of tears because that is where she had to leave her baby behind and didn't get to see her daughter until nine years later. Um, and then, of course, you know, you have the symbolism of the skyscrapers of New York and the plains of the Netherlands where you're more egalitarian. And that's just one of the ways that I try to think about visual things um, as I'm writing the novel. Jean, um, one of the dark family secrets um, it, it are one of the 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 big underpinnings of this novel that that even though we have the surface story of uh, uh, of a family reuniting, there's there are undercurrents of, uh, of of the things that have been going on for quite a while that no one wants to talk about and that that have uh, th that that factor into the relationships, but we kind of want to avoid um, those things. Do, do you think about these kinds of subplots uh, and, and these these secrets that you get to weave into the story? Do you think about that from the beginning or, or do those things kind of work in in the telling? You know, I think both are true. I mean, I think when I think about a book, you know, when I start to write a book, I always like to... Um, of course, I like to have the story, but then I also have to be interested in the novel intellectually. You know, there has to be a kind of overarching question that I'm thinking about and that I'm trying to answer in some way in the novel. And in Searching for Sylvia Lee, the question for me was, how well do we truly know the people we love most? You know, how possible is it to actually know another person? And I think it's hard to know another person. <laughs> you know, I mean, how yeah. many of us have have not been completely shocked and betrayed by somebody that we love? You know, somebody that we thought we knew inside out who would never, ever, ever do X, Y, and Z. And then there they go. You know, they went, right. they did it. And there you are with your mouth open thinking, I can't believe that this just happened. I can't believe that just happened. So um I um thought that, you know, once you start thinking about a question like that, then there are obviously, sadly, events in your own life that will cluster to that question that will naturally kind of flow forth onto the page. So as I'm writing the book, of course, those things become more defined and small details come up. But a lot of the big things like the missing jewelry in the novel, uh, you know, the big kind of mystery of what happened to Sylvie, her past, her job, her relationship with her husband. Of those things I, I did have in my mind as I was writing the book from the beginning. Your first two books, Girl in Translation and, and Mambo in Chinatown, uh, helped you to solidify yourself with a base of readers who loved what you did. Um, those books were very well received. and. Um, you know, formed the basis for your writing career. But when Searching for Sylvie Lee came out, it kind of went to a, another level. Um, were you surprised by how many people loved this book and the reception that it received? Yes, I was. I mean, I think that when I first showed the novel to my agent, she was really excited. I had never heard her be so excited. So that was, I mean, that was great. That was a great sign. But I do think that something that's unusual about Searching for Sylvie Lee is that it is a very literary novel, but it also has a real plot. You know, it's really a suspense mystery about what happened to Sylvie Lee and looking for both Sylvie Lee, the person, and who Sylvie Lee really was. And so those things, um, were, you know, you could think that that would make a beautiful harmony, or you could think that that is a kind of strange mix. And we went out to a lot of editors in New York City with the novel, and a lot of people were interested. So I flew to New York, and I had this 
you know, week packed with meetings at different publishing houses, talking to people who um, wanted to buy the book and, you know, were wanted to publish it. And when I go, you know, that's kind of like speed dating when you do that. <laughs> and, you know, when you go in, for me, the most important question is always, how do you think you could improve the book? Because I need to know if we're on the same page. You know, I want them to help me improve the book. Absolutely. But I just need to make sure that, like, if somebody thinks of it as a horror novel and, you know, that, then that's not going to work because I right. don't see it as horror and we're going to be at, at, you know, at each other's throats by the end of the editing process. So I need to know that we're on the same page. So I asked this, and what was really interesting was that there were a lot of editors who said, you know, we don't really need the immigrant story. You could just cut that. <laughs> we can just go and make it much more thrillery and much more, you know, gone girl. Like we could just take in the gone girl direction. And then, you know, I had editors that was much more literary who said, you know, we don't need all that gone girl stuff. We don't need the plot. We don't need the story. We don't need the mystery. We can cut all that out. <laughs> we can just concentrate on this beautiful literary um, novel about this immigrant family and relationship between these three women. And so that was really interesting. And I felt very fortunate that my current editor, Jessica Williams of William Morrow, was some, you know, was one of the editors who saw the novel the way I did, which was that she really um, loved both parts of the book and wanted to enhance both the page turning elements of the novel and the deeper themes and relationships between the characters. So um, we did that. And then it was really, you know, it was really wonderful that the book, the book got hit almost 50 must read lists before it ever came out. And we got reviewed, you know, everywhere. Um, and it was just really wonderful to have that support. And not have people write it off as, oh, yes, this is just, you know, uh, you know, this is just a kind of really commercial novel that we've seen a million times before. But that, you know, people really took the time to say, well, this is a very interesting mix of um, different elements. Well, and, and what an amazing accomplishment the, this book, uh, the journey that this book has taken. Um, speaking of that divide between commercial fiction and, and plot driven fiction and more literary fiction, how do you feel about that divide? And do, uh, do you take offense if if someone tries to put your writing in one bucket or the other? No, absolutely not. I think that I always try to write the very best book I can write. Um, and, you know, that might be what's in fashion at the time. It might not be. You know, I I really love stories. I love plotting. I love storytelling. So I, I will, I don't think I can ever really write a novel that's just kind of meandering around and with a lot of beautiful language and not much happening. I like the structure um, of a story and I like playing with that structure and pulling the reader along. I think that what I do think is a little bit of a pity is that I do think that people nowadays, there's a kind of modern tendency to say that, you know, plot is commercial, that, you know, if you have a plot, that means you're commercial. I think that's just ridiculous because plot conveys meaning more than almost anything else you can do in the book. I mean, you can have beautiful writing, you can have imagery and symbolism, but what actually happens? Right. to your characters is bringing forth so much meaning um, to, you know, what you're trying to say about the world and, you know, life. So I, I do think that, uh, I, I think that there doesn't need to be a divide between, you know, literary and other fiction. I think, to me, I think more about how can you make a book as good as possible? Um, you know, how do you make it as powerful, as emotionally moving as possible, and, you know, also as intellectually interesting as possible? Very well put. The book is called Searching for Sylvie Lee. It is out uh, in paperback now. It just came out a couple of days ago when you're hearing this. Uh, so now it's available in paperback and hardcover, if you prefer that. And uh, one of my favorite formats, audiobook. Um, there's a fantastic audiobook 
at audible.com that you can grab. Uh, also, I believe audio CDs you can get from uh, from Amazon as well. Um, Gene, how do, you, how do you feel about the audio book of this? Oh, I love the audio book. And, you know, what I what I really appreciate from my publisher is that um, they really ran the audio book by me. So they sent me a huge list of possible narrators. And, you know, I I listened to all of them. I narrowed it down and I chose the three narrators um, for the audiobook of Searching for Sylvie Lee myself. And I think they did just an incredible job. It's so moving to hear your own work be acted by these really gifted uh, voice actresses. And a lot of them are also real actresses, you know, on L.A. Law and things like that. But to to just hear them bring out the emotion and the feeling of the novel in a way that I really never could if I had to read it is you know it's just incredible. We'll put links in the show notes of this episode where you can grab it in whatever format you love. Um, Gene, if if people are just discovering you and want to dig into all the stuff that you do, is there a place where they can connect with you online? Sure. I mean, the main place is, of course, if they want to look at my website, everything's connected to that. That's just genequok.com, uh, quok, K-W-O-K. But I'm also on Instagram, I'm on Twitter, and I'm on Facebook. So I love hearing from uh, readers and, you know, people who are just interested in connecting. Great. We'll put a link to your website in the show notes. Uh, of this episode as well. Gene, this has been so much fun chatting. Thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Thank you. I have just loved talking with you. A hitman with a conscience. Ian Bragg is paid to kill people. Only bad people and not many, but for a great deal of money. Case the target. Make the hit. Move on until he meets the woman with sparkling green eyes who changes everything. A few pre-readers had this to say about Ian Bragg. Mark Dawson, million-selling thriller author, says a rip-roaring ride from start to breathless finish. Craig Martell hit a home run with the operator. The taut, lean prose and lightning-fast pace make this a page-turner without sacrificing an ounce of story or depth. You'll find yourself rooting for the hitman main character as he faces the toughest decision of his career. The Operator is the start of a new thriller series I expect to see burning up bestseller list for years to come, says A.C. Fuller, author of the Crime Beat and Alex Vane media thrillers. Suave, romantic, and lethal, Ian Bragg is everything you want in a highly paid assassin. Can't wait to ride this train, says James Blatch, self-publishing formula. It's been a long time since I fell this hard in love with a book, a very long time. Author of Women of Wine County Romantic Suspense, Terry Wells Brown says, Grab this book from Craig Martell, The Operator. Bone Thief, John Driscoll, Book One by Thomas O'Callaghan. A sociopathic killer is using the internet to lure seemingly random women to their gruesome deaths in New York City. During his heinous murder spree, this madman is extracting the bones of his victims. His sheer brutality has the residents of the Big Apple in panic mode. Who is this twisted psycho who's abducted a housewife in broad daylight only to dispose of her lifeless body alongside a lake in Prospect Park, nailed the boneless remains of a nameless drifter to the underside of a boardwalk at Rockaway Beach, allowed the gutted corpse of a single parent to wash ashore under the Brooklyn Bridge and has had the audacity to leave the desecrated body of the Magnolia Tea heiress rotting atop trash at one of the city's sanitation dumps. NYPD's top cop, Homicide Commander John W. Driscoll, has never witnessed such savagery. Hammered daily by the district attorney, the mayor, and the police commissioner, the lieutenant who's battling his own inner demons, must use every resource available to put an end to the killings. In a race against time, Driscoll, aided by Sergeant Alagante and Detective Cedric Tomlinson, sets out on a roller coaster of an investigation to first identify the villainous fiend and then put an end to his butchering. Grab Bone Thief by Thomas O'Callaghan 